Hi, I'm Dana Feldman, and I am a journalist with Reuters and Variety. Hi, Joseph Middleton, um, casting director, work at Paramount now. I'm Randy Hiller, I'm casting director and work at Disney. And I'm Beth Klein, and I work at Universal Television and Casting. Okay, so um, for the first question, um, Joseph and Randy, you have both been casting directors on both the studio side as well as independently. And I, would, I was wondering if you could explain the, the different processes and the pros and cons for both. And then for Beth, would you ever in the future want to go the independent casting route? We'll start with Joseph. Um, well, I, okay. How do we? God. <laughs> so this is like you know that moment before you go in for your audition, and there's like several of you waiting in the lobby, and you're like, I really know my stuff, but I still need to go in there and prove it to everybody that's just staring at me. Well, that's how I'm feeling. So here we go. I'll, I will try to give you a very good audition here. Um, so I was an independent for a very long time. I'm, I can't quite remember the years because then you'll calculate my age, but um, it was a long time. And then Paramount um, came to me and said, um, would you be interested? And I said, well, if I wait another five years, they won't ask me, so maybe I should try it. And then I tried it, and I really like being there. And I would say that the biggest difference for me um, is now I'm in the middle of casting my first movie for Paramount, so I've been there a year and a half almost two years, so for the first year, um, all I did was get to know my fellow casting directors, which, believe it or not, we don't know all the other casting directors out there like you do. Um, sometimes our paths will cross, but sometimes they don't cross, so you really don't know as many casting directors as you think you should or, or, or want to. So sometimes you develop relationships. We developed a strong relationship over the years. Um, and But going into a studio, that's the first thing you do is you learn all the casting directors out there and you learn all the ways that they do their job. So some of them do their job very similar to the way that I did my job in the same kind of atmosphere, the same type of organizational skills and the same sort of relationship of either giving the information or not giving the information to um, your executives. And um, then you feel like, then at least for me, I found out, oh, they do a job really well. Up closer oh, to your mouth, there we go. <laughs> they do, sorry, they do a job really well, or they don't do the job that I would have done, or, you know, sometimes it's both sides. It's like you're like, oh my God, they're so good. <laughs> or you go, oh my God, they're a lot messier than I ever imagined any <laughs> casting director to be. So that's the working. So we oversee at the same time guide, so part of it is I feel like that my bosses, um, Brad Gray and Adam Goodman and Mark Evans, they all have a point of view, and just like if they were my directors, and that's how I sort of see them, are they're, they're my directors, so as a casting director I have to educate them or move them a little bit toward my taste, and I also move my taste a little bit toward theirs so that I keep them happy. So that's a lot of that is making sure that all the roles are up to par, even the small roles in different countries, and then um, making kind of a parallel list of every list that a casting director does. We have our own list within the studio, and so that if something happens, we always have an idea ready. So the biggest difference, I would say, is access. Everybody comes to us at a studio, everyone wants to do a general, all my theater is paid for, all my movies are paid for, all my travel to London and New York are paid for. So that sort of access as an independent I didn't have. So that, for that part, it's, it's an amazing gift to be within a studio with a lot of access. It's sort of like marrying into a very rich family. <laughs> But with that rich family, there comes an incredible amount of responsibility. So I would say that that would be major, the biggest kind of overview of what I do and the difference. I don't know how I follow that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Joseph pretty much has it right. I think um, I started my job about two months or three months after you did, something like that. So we kind of fumbled our way with a lot of phone calls to each other asking questions. Um, 
there's definitely things you miss. I miss about being an independent casting director, like the relationship of just a one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the directors, and, and I can only work at Disney now, so there's people that I just adore, and they're doing movies elsewhere, and it's heartbreaking. And then there's a lot of really interesting things that, that I never knew, or like my whole view, I'd worked at all the major studios, but the way it actually runs is so completely different than what I ever expected it to be. I thought there was one corporate meeting a year, and they said, okay, these are the five movies we're making, and then it went from there, and it, it's, it, it's not, it's not the case. It's all, almost like one gigantic independent movie house, and things are constantly coming up, and new projects are coming in, and new directors are entering, so, so in that, in that way, it's really, it's really interesting, and I think, you know, I arrived at Disney and there's been a lot of change going on and now Alan Horn, you know, has taken over the studio and, and I was also hired by Sean Bailey who's fantastic and I think that the really interesting thing now is at that studio at least, they went from making a lot of movies to making almost none to making a lot more but being now incredibly more focused on the material they're making and, and story. Like what I find fascinating is both Alan Horn and Sean can come into a meeting and look like on page eight when blah 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 says blah blah blah. I don't think that pays off, and you're thinking like I can't even remember what script that was, and you know exactly what page it was and all of that. So it's it's interesting to see how involved they are at different levels and how open they are on a lot of levels. I mean, there's still definitely you know need star names in a lot of places, but there's also you know we've hired a number of people that that aren't very known in, in, in the short time that I've been there. For you, Beth. So I'm on the TV side, they're in, in the feature film side, so it's a little bit different. And I was at a network, and now I'm at a studio, which is definitely a switch. But I, when I was at Showtime, I got to do some of the casting myself, as well as oversee the way the three of us are doing now. Um, I don't know that I'm cut out to be an independent casting director, if I'm going to be really honest. I, I think what you guys did, it's really hard. You don't always know where your next job is coming from. Um, while there's freedom, there's uncertainty. And I'm more a creature of habit, if I'm going to be honest. Um, I like having a job to go to every day and feel very lucky to have the one I do. Um, Universal Television is a year old now, um, a new studio. Um, our sister, our parent company is NBC, but we produce for all different networks. And um, I love the people that I'm working with. They're very kind of entrepreneurial, and, and um, we're a small but mighty group, and um, we're having a great time. So I don't know that at this point in my life that independent casting would be the right move for me, kind of lifestyle-wise. Can I ask, how much say, as a casting director, do you have on the final decision making uh, in conjunction with the director and the producers on a project? It varies so much from project. I mean, this is speaking both independent and studio. It depends on how strong the director's vision is. Sometimes, you know, there's certain directors that you can just say, you meet somebody and go like, oh my God, blah, 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 I love this guy. Like you just, it, it really depends on the level of trust and the project and the situation. And I mean, I still, I still do cast some stuff in house at Disney and do a lot of like, so unfortunately the next four movies we're doing are all being shot overseas. So I do like the American side of what's, what's going on, yeah. Is that the same for you, for both of you as well, that it depends project to project? Yeah, I actually think Beth might have a stronger voice than our voice. I feel like you're, because you've been doing that a long time, so her relationships, we have new relationships. So our old relationships were with directors, you know, like, Doug Lyman for me, if I think on our last movie with Doug, I basically was like, this is a person, and this is a person, and this is, and by the way, with that comes a responsibility that if you're watching that screen and that person is bad, the only person you have to look to it, you can't blame anyone else. You have to blame yourself, right? Thank goodness they were all great. But, um, but I feel like because of how many years you've been in the business and how many years you, you've Ooh, been at old. the, no, not old, no, but the, because she had, I, I feel like, right, your relationships, that takes time to trust and to build, and you know, you have to figure out where where you can push and where you have to to go okay there are a lot of cooks you know in the kitchen at a studio in a studio movie and we hire casting directors and the same as my executives or have producers and the directors and we we we're spending good money so if we're spending a lot of money I think we should trust the people that we hire um, otherwise, I shouldn't have hired you, right? Same with an actor. I've got to believe in you, or I should have moved up to the, or argued against you um, at the right time. So 
in that, I believe that only time will tell with my relationship with my bosses um, on whether that will work or, you know, I've got, to, I've, I've got to build that trust. But the other thing, we have a lot of meetings. The, the thing as an independent, what I never understood, and I feel like every, and this feels almost better suited for young casting directors and associates out there, this conversation, because I'm not sure how it applies to you, but this is what I would say it should apply. The next time you're on a set and you see an executive walking up and someone says, oh, here comes the suits, then you should turn around and say, yeah, you know what, that suit over there is helping getting your movie made. That suit over there is killing themselves back at the studio because I never knew that when I left as an independent casting director that Beth was still there trying to make sure that the other seven layers of people above her were making sure that they were happy and taken care of and, and felt confident in what I was doing. And so nobody is alone. Once you believe that, you, that there's only one person that got you that job, you, there is seven other invisible people behind you that are rooting for you and have never met you, right? So. Yeah, no, I think it's really true. I think that um, all of us as, as executives at the studios now, whether it's TV or film, um, we're kind of gatekeepers. You know, I think our job is to, um, with a lot of finesse, <laughs> you know, try and move a large group of people yeah. in, in the right, what we think is the right direction. Um, hopefully, you know, and it's not just, sometimes, unfortunately, it's not even just who's the best actor. I would love for it to just be who's the best actor, but the, you got to look at the big picture, which all of us have to do, and I think when you work at a studio or a network, you go to all these meetings, you get called to sit in a marketing meeting or an advertising meeting or a digital meeting or a budget meeting, you, everyone starts realizing how many layers it takes how many, you know, hundreds of people to, to get that product out there, to be able to start production on a movie and hire hopefully all of you as actors. Um, and, and I think our job is to try and, you know, I don't know if gatekeeper is the sexiest phrase in the world, but I do think we're trying to bring the right actors in and then convince a lot of people. There are so many cooks in the kitchen who get to decide about casting, unfortunately. And um, it's very subjective, you know. My opinion may not be the same as Randy's or Joseph's, but um, we try and move a large group of people in hopefully the right direction so that there's success for everyone. When you say it's not always about the best actor, what else, what other ingredients are in the mix. I think, I think so what's interesting about sitting in some of those meetings is you realize sometimes it's not even about the actor, it's that, but it's each person has a different vision of what that movie is going to be. And there might be one actor that's best suited for this particular version of that movie, but this actor might be better for that particular version. Like, it's, do you have a sense of levity? Do you want to go darker with it? What, what, is, what are all of those pieces? And that constantly shifts, and sometimes that changes with the draft of a script that changes, you know, under a lot of circumstances. From department to department. Yeah. So you can have an international department sitting there at the studio, and of course they're thinking about each territory that they're going to now have to go and promote their movie with, right? So their interest is, okay, who's the biggest actor in India? Who's the biggest actor in Brazil right now? Because these are emerging markets for us. So who are those actors that can get on those talk shows and, and sell our movie because that's the way it's going to make money and that's how we're going to be paid, right? So each department, so publicity might want the girl that can get on the Maxim versus somebody that says, well, I'm not sure that girl can, can get the same publicity that this other girl, and if it's that role, can my department at least have that, where's that girl in this movie for me? Mm -hmm. So it becomes all these things where you're like, what hot girl? There's no hot girl in the movie. Right. It's just like, like, where? And they're like, well, let's find a place for one. I mean, those are the conversations. But all they're thinking is trying to help sell their movies so that the more people that see that movie, the more dollars come back and the more movies we can make. It's business. Say I'm an actor and I'm auditioning for a role and I look around the room, I'm waiting for my turn. And um, there are dozens of other actors. We all fit the same physical profile that they're looking for. I can easily assume that we're all, you know, equally talented. Um, what do I do when I stand in front of each of you that's going to make me stand out with the other 100 people, the other 100 brunette 
Jewish, quirky, you know, 30-somethings. I, I feel like every time I've done a panel, I've said this, and it's sort of the only thing that, the only thing you can equate casting to is dating. Mm -hmm. And there's no, it's all subjective. Like, sometimes it's everything you find attractive in somebody, but it just doesn't click. Or it's everything that usually turns you off, but you can't take your eyes off them. And, and there's, I mean, there's, and there's, you have to, for, you can't forget, too, that the people making the choices are people. If you remind the director of the guy that stole his first girlfriend and he's never recovered from, you're not getting the job. It's just not <laughs> happening. You know, it's, it's, it, you, all you can do is make your definitive choices, be the best you you can be. I think don't think about what they want, think about what you want to do with the role, because quite often everybody thinks they know what they want until somebody comes in and does something completely different, then that's what they want. Um, no, and I think consistency. I think you can't sit there and look at those 12 people. I think you can't be thinking about that movie. You need to be thinking about the work that you do. So if you are prepared, and willing to play and really go in there and do your job, then that may not work out for you. But if you're prepared and you don't have a chip on your shoulder and you come in and, you're, and you do good work, then I'm gonna not remember you, maybe not for that project, but I'll remember you for the four other projects that I'm doing down the road. Mm -hmm. And that sort of in our, I think in all our jobs, is the good thing about being at a corporation or that, that is we're looking at a big umbrella of things as versus when I was an independent, I was looking at one thing, right? So now I'm looking at seven things and seven things that may go or may not go. So that kind of work, and it's not just the work that you do for me as a casting director, but for any casting director that you read that we are hiring, all those auditions go to me. So those auditions, we're, those are, we're watching those. So a good actor is always, we're, we're, we're not trying to keep good actors away from us. We're looking for good actors. And sometimes, the, if you don't trust a director, if you don't trust that he's gonna, you wanna make sure that you can get somebody in there that will be really prepared, that doesn't have an attitude, that goes in there, does a job, not too needy. Go in there, do your job, go home. That's what, it, also it works. Yeah, I think that you need to, when you go into an audition, what are the things you can control? And that's what I would have you focus on. You can control how prepared you are. You can control making a strong choice and sticking to it. Um, I think if you walk out of that audition think, saying to yourself, you know what, I did the best job I could do. I feel good about it. And the rest of it is completely out of my control at this point in time. Um, you're going to find you're, you do consistent good auditions and as Joseph said, you know, if it doesn't pay off for this immediate one, we do remember people. We do call them and say, hey, come back in and do this or here, we're just offering you the part because you were so good last time, it just didn't work out. You know, I think you have to know yourself as an actor, know what you need to give a good audition and, you know, focus on those things. I probably won't offer, I'll bring you back seven times, but don't <laughs> worry about that, just keep coming back and back and back. <laughs> That's what I feel like the process is now. We come, we, you read and then you read again, and then you, four weeks later you read again, and then two months later you read again, it, right? That seems to be the process. I think well, the interesting thing to remember, too, is there's a whole world going on that you're not aware of that, that's gone from years back. I mean, I can't tell you how many times you'll be working on something or somebody else is working on something. You're like, remember the guy that we saw in that thing? What's his name? Oh, yeah, we should see that guy. And they, like, crazy stories happen like that mm -hmm. on a daily basis from years and years ago. I mean, I did an HBO movie like two years ago, and there was an actor that I worked at a talent agency, my first job in LA, and he was a client there, and he's a big deal, and he kind of disappeared. And I, out of the blue, for no reason, I was like, whatever happened to him? And I IMD beat him and brought him in for something. And he, you know, he was way, way older. He gained a bunch of weight. I brought him in and he got like a role playing Diane Lane's brother on his first shot. And it was just like so random, just happened to be somebody that somewhere came to mind. And, and he happened to be in Los Angeles. He doesn't even live there. Like weird things like that happen constantly when it comes to casting. That leads into my next question, which is for the people not in the room that are going to be watching this um, live stream that are all over the country, how does somebody in Arkansas get on your radar? I think there's, well, there's, there, the best way now is there's a lot of open casting calls happening digitally. And, you know, you can now just blitz it out to the world and have people put auditions d down. I mean, the tricky part of that is you're kind of in a vacuum. You don't get to ask a lot of questions. You have the material to go on. But if you're there, that's sort of the only way to really get notice is to see your work. A, a postcard just doesn't give enough. Yeah. 
Do or local you, casting. That's, I mean, you know, so many, so few jobs are being shot in Los Angeles that, I mean, I know actors that switch off in an apartment in New Mexico, like wherever the tax credits are, wherever the movies are going. And the smart thing is to, you know, if, if you're from that area, get to know the local casting directors because that's where a lot of the parts are coming from. Do you take self-submissions if people send you? Do they have to go through an agent? The, the tricky thing about self-submissions is they have to be timed so incredibly right. So it's, you know, it works better in television than film because if you're right for something, you might be right for something at that moment but not be right for something again for another seven years and you can't keep all of that stuff. So it's really about submitting, you know, a self-submission for a part that you're right for, not, not blindly. How can an agent best represent a client of theirs to you to make that client stand out? Well, I, I, I call it, I think, for actors, and I think I've said it at a panel here before, um, you, is graciously aggressive. Mm -hmm. I think that those are the two words that I would use for anyone's business. Your business, my business. You, you have to make sure that, you're aware, that I'm aware of you, but you have to do it in such a way that I'm, that I'm not freaked out by you, <laughs> right? And, that, and it's a fine line sometimes with people, right? So, um, so I think that, you know, listen, I've always been very open about my email, about my work email. It's not my personal email, it's a work email. And by the way, I don't go to it now that I'm at Paramount, I rarely go to it. But as an independent, I would go to it, and when I can't sleep at night, I would go, oh, let me click on some of these submissions and, and some people's you know, um, auditions or monologues or whatever they did. And then I think I've hired a couple of people that it was just like that. It's, it's really like playing the lottery. It's like, you know, that your number got hit, and I think it's a random number that, so what, what I do find, though, now, is that you have in the internet, which you can create your own material, and I don't know anything about it, so I'm not telling you how to do it, but I do know that that is one way to, if you're, I was living in Arkansas, or if I was living in LA, I would go, I, you don't have to wait for us to hire you. There is now, you, everybody has a camera, everybody has a connection to YouTube, you can start your own webisodes, and by the way, it's like, we look at those, and I look at like, who's trending, what, are the, what series are trending, who's out there working? In that, so it's not. I'm, you know, the the responsibility about how when we get opportunities is also. I need to see everything. I need to know who's in the play, how that play is, how good it was, who are the good actors out there, who's working that I might be able to, because you don't want to be caught in a meeting that someone says, oh, someone's fantastic, but you haven't seen that movie. So you should be out there look watching every movie. Oh, yeah. You should be making your decisions too. You should be acting as your own casting director going, okay, I understand that when you watch Lincoln, because I just watched Lincoln, um, you watch Lincoln, that Spielberg has all these connections. So all his day roles, even the small, you're like, I could do that. And you're like, unless you were like a very like hot actor, you even those smallest roles were of actors that have had like John Hawks is in a tiny, tiny role, probably get nominated for Academy Award. So at that level, you can watch really fine acting. And then you can search and go, who am I like? Who, who gets the work, who gets the jobs that I'm most suited for? And then follow that career because that person might be working and they might need somebody like that person in another role. So I think it's all about being active and mm -hmm. aggressive but being gracious. Is there a time that any of you fought for an actor for a particular role that nobody else believed was right? but you really believed in that particular person and what was the outcome? So often. <laughs> um, you win some, lose some. And there's some, you know, certain things you're incredibly proud of and there's certain things of like, you know, you have to fast forward past that part in a movie because you just know someone would have been better. You know, but, but those are the, it's really, it's a bummer to lose, but, but sometimes someone else, you know, some, sometimes you lose and you're happy you lost. You know what I mean? It's just, you can only, you can only fight for as much as you, you know, as you see that role to be. Sometimes you fight against and then you watch the movie and you're like, I fought against that. Yeah. That wasn't worth the fight. That was like a blip and he actually didn't blow it. So, you know, that was a fight I shouldn't have had. Right, yeah. I mean, you know, in television, we unfortunately 
have the ability to <laughs> shoot a pilot and then rethink all of our choices. <laughs> and I found this year uh, we picked up series and fired a lot of actors and went back and spent a lot of money to reshoot things with different actors. But not because they were bad, but because necessarily, but because mm -hmm. like you were saying, different yep. visions of what that storytelling exactly. was going to be. And what you originally thought we started out with and then the finished product was something different. We also had a lot of issues with chemistry this year with, um, you know, finding that intangible something, that spark, and um, found that once it was up on the screen it wasn't working and had to fire people. It wasn't because they were bad actors, it was because that spark wasn't there and we really needed it to do the proper storytelling. So, um, it, and that's just really painful and happens to some really great people, by the way. So, um, we second guess ourselves too much and things change quite a bit from start to finish, from what you originally read on a page to what gets shot to what it looks like after editing to what it looks like either up on the big screen or the TV screen. And, you know, it changes so many times. Speaking back to the webisodes and podcasts and YouTube that you, I was going to ask if you scan those um, mm -hmm. for talent and you answered that. Do you think because of this plethora of new mediums that are now available to actors that it has been made easier for people to make it or do you think the odds are still the same as far as the success rate somebody wanting to I think there's I think there's more opportunity again I'll just speak for television there's so many more projects out there than there used to be because there are so many more networks and and you know things that are just going straight to the web and and all these digital platforms and, and you know and Netflix and and now Amazon is going to make their own original programming um, you know it's, so I think there are more opportunities I don't know if that means more people are succeeding though well it's just better than reality shows right, right. so <laughs> and I, I think in features there just it's true every studio is making less features than they had in the past and you know all the hedge fund money is gone so there's not so many independents happening so you know, I think if you do something that breaks out, you have, you have a much better chance, and there's, it's a, one more way to break out. But I do think there's also just so much more information and so many more people coming at you that there's only so many hours in the day. You try to keep as much um, to, on top of everything as much as you possibly can, but there's no human way possible to know everybody. Right. And also now you're competing against the world. You used to just compete against mostly yourselves, um, and, that, and now the entire world and I mean the entire world is now competing against everyone mm -hmm. because it's so easy. What makes it easy for you in Arkansas, we'll use Arkansas tonight, <laughs> um, to get your, your audition to me, it's the same as that I can sit and do readings with you know, actors in South Africa and in Jordan and in Germany like that now. So now all those managers and agents are coming over and because they see that there's a market here and they're like, okay, let's see how we can enter and become part of that market. What is a big mistake that you see actors make that you could tell these people here to avoid? In an audition or just in general? I think they're pretty much the same that have always stood. I mean, don't people come in and make excuses for themselves right off the bat. I, never a good job, never a good thought, you know what I mean? Because also I've seen people talk themselves out of a job with directors in the room. The director might have thought they were really good and they're making so many excuses. The director second guesses themselves and then is like, yeah, no, no, forget it. Um, I think it's, I think questions are always welcome, but sometimes people use questions as a way to connect and the questions don't really apply. I mean, I remember once reading a role for a waiter and it was a callback with the director and he was like, where's the waiter from? And he was asking all these questions, and the director just felt like, I've got one day to get those four scenes. There's no way I can accomplish it with this guy. You know, it's, it's, it's being really prepared. It's having a clear vision of what you want to do. It's, and not being defensive. Yeah, yeah. That's it. We're, I think a lot, it's like, and I, it's, it's like coming up here. There's, you, you have nerves, so we all are nervous people. We're mm -hmm. just... All right, so you have to realize that that is part of it, and you, if you're more prepared and you know what you're talking about or you know what you're doing, then you can get through it. But at the same time, if I ask you to really change it up, then I want you to be really prepared, but I also want you to not hold on to it so tight that you can't do that or somehow I've ruined it for you. 
um, <laughs> right? So I need you to move quickly. And the other thing I would say is, what I find a lot, and it's not fair, but you should have a really good um, class in um, cold reading. Because it's forever, I'm like, oh, you're not right for that, but you're right for this. And then, of course, I'm selfish, and I want to get my job done right away. So I'm like, oh, it's really easy. It's two pages, nothing. You know, it's like, it's so you. You can do this. And then I'm like, I'll give you, like, I'll read a couple of people, and then you'll read for me, and I know it's cold. But I'm still judging it, by the way, right? So, <laughs> so it's cold, but be good. So... <laughs> So I would think that the more you're, you, you work that gym muscle, whatever that is, that, that work muscle, I think it is a good thing to have as actors coming in the room. I also think you have to work on your skills of listening. I think that we all as humans, when someone starts asking us a question or you start formulating your response before the person who's talking is finished, so you probably miss part of what they said because you're already deciding what you're going to say. And I think that we, you have to remember that aside from giving a good performance, a director, producer, a casting director wants to know what you're going to be like on the set. So they want to know you can listen. They want to know you can take direction. They want to know that you're pliable and that you can mix it up if they need you to. Um, you know, it's a lot of skills to bring into one room and one audition, but I find so many times that actors, um, th their nerves get the best of them and they stop listening and that can really hurt you. I think we should take some questions from the audience. So, okay, let's see here. The first um, question is, do you have a favorite project that you've cast? Mm. All of us? Yeah, like here, let's hear each of your favorite project or person that you've cast in a role that blew you away. I don't, I mean, I wouldn't, I, they're so, by the way, they're like babies. Mm -hmm. They really are. I mean, it's like, I don't have children, but that's how I would feel if I had a child because some of them hurt, some of them are bad, some of them are beautiful, some nobody's ever seen, you know, it's like, but, you know, I gave, I, I give a lot to my movies and I care about them. So it, that being said that, you know, you're always your first movie that sort of hits, um, or, or this one did go, didn't hit, but at least it made people at the studios aware um, and I've done that director's movies ever since, so I have a real heart for Doug Lyman's movies. So those, he was good to me, so therefore his movies sort of touched me. Which was the first one you did for him? A go. Go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Joseph's right. I think, you know, I've done a couple of movies with a director named Gavin O'Connor, and I think I'm probably most attached to those movies, but basically because he's really demanding, but not in a bad way. But I've ended up like auditioning real criminals and real cops and hockey players and wrestlers. And you end up meeting an enormous amount of people you would never meet in any situation and do this. Some, some of the real, like some of this co criminal stuff was stupid. But um, just had, I ended up being the closest to the production, the people involved, just because I've been there like day in and day out doing stuff that probably I shouldn't have been doing just to get results. And I, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's always more about the, ex I think it's the experience on a final product. Yeah, I have probably, a, you know, a ton of projects that are near and dear to me, but I'd say most recently, the most fun I've had in really, really long casting sessions was when we did the casting for episodes on Showtime. We just laughed and laughed and had so much fun and it was so collaborative and um, it was just one of many fabulous experiences, but. Okay, uh, what is the future of production in Los Angeles? Am I better off in a secondary market? What was the first part, sorry. What is the future of production in Los Angeles? Am I better off in a secondary market? No, you're, you, you're belonging, listen, this is the center it's like I think everybody's waiting to be here and I think that it's, you know, be happy where you are and listen, if you're in Atlanta or you're in New Orleans or you're in Michigan right now, those are good places to be too. So don't move out here. Stay there. <laughs> Build up your resume and your credits there. Um, you know, but I always say that this is where most you, listen, if you want to do theater, then you're in the wrong place. But if you want to do film and television, this, this is the place to, you know, find yourself. That being said, um, I do, I mean, I do think there's something to be said just, 
just, you know, it's, it's a government issue way above all of us in this whole tax credit situation, which, you know, went down years ago. And we're not giving enough money. There are incentives, so it's getting better here, but not to the level that we need, that a lot of roles are being cast locally. I mean, I had one year where I think I did six movies and all were in Pittsburgh. You know, and so that market, and you know, the competition isn't as fierce. You know, there's just not as many people, and in some of those markets, there's not a lot of great actors. So I feel like if you want to build up those those resumes, it's not. It, I'm not saying to move, but it's really not a bad idea to check out some of those areas. And for all of you from Pittsburgh, I found very good actors in Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> were you out there? No. <laughs> no there, there were some, but I'm just saying, you know, but, different areas in general. But don't you think? Don't you think it would be smart? to if, you know, Lynn, listen, it's about money, right? So you have to figure out how you have your money and where you save your money. But it's, if you could establish yourself in Pittsburgh and let Donna Belichick and let right. those casting directors know, I am willing, and now we're going into SAG areas because right. I'm always arguing like, tell people you'll be a local hire. And I think SAG only will allow certain people in a certain radius of living there. Um, so I'm, I have no idea, so I will just tell you, don't play that back. But, um, but I think that you should know those casting directors in Atlanta. You should know the casting directors that are in New Orleans. You should know the casting directors that are, are, are where the, our movies are going. And how do you find where the movies are going? You follow the money. Where, what states do your research? What states are doing the biggest tax incentives now? That's where you'll find the movies. And then I would also say, um, for the international audience and for you that want to go to international, we're shooting so many movies overseas now yeah. and that and I'm always looking for the American actor in that movie. Um, so those are territories and places and casting directors that you should get to know. And how do you get to know them? You write them, you find out from Casting Society an email, you, you know, there are many ways, and then you do an introduction, and hopefully if you write the right letter, if you send the right clip, if you, you know, if you, if you can get in touch with somebody, and I don't know how you do it, but that's your job. But there are, there are visa issues, though, too. I mean, that's a hard thing with the international stuff. You have to have a visa. I'm the positive no. one. She's like so real. Well, well, no, right? no, but well, it's so well, true, it's just right? there's a structure. I mean, it's right. the same way when, com when people are coming here, how many, you know, so often somebody would get it, will get a job and their visa won't come up right. Right through in time. You can't hire them. So it's the same thing if you're going overseas and you have one parent, like that happens a lot. Like you have a parent that's Irish and you're still able to, you know, apply to have a visa from that country to do it before you go, you know? Oh, so you can't just go over there in Hungary and work, right? No. Nope. Never mind. <laughs> but you can do it's a it good idea, States. though, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's, but, there, uh, but there are some people who have dual passports yeah. still, so, and that works, yeah. right? Yep. No, yeah. No Is there any point to attempting an acting career at 55 years old? Is there hesitation to work with someone my age who does not already have an established career? No, we're always looking yeah. for, I mean, it's, it, it's a certain thing. It's like, it, listen, are you going to get the, you know, there's certain hierarchy of roles, right? So if you, there's always that list that we're going to go to, right? That yeah. it's like, oh my goodness, if someone's so if you can get there, oh my God, it'd be great, right? But then there's roles that they're like, I'm not doing that role. It's too small. It's one scene or the, so then it's about getting the best actor. Catherine Houston was the perfect example of that. Yeah. You know, she was an amazing woman. She sadly passed away, I think, last year. But I mean, I think I met her in a workshop a, a number of years ago. And you know, and she was always fantastic. She probably started in her 50s and won an Emmy. You know, she's yeah. just a great lady, great actress. Started late. Do you have? Oh, I agree. Okay. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's another question of, in the same regard: What are the challenges in casting older actors? I don't think it's really a challenge. I think it's just a matter of there being the roles available. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always been an issue, the same thing I could say with women. My former business partner and I were once counting how many women were in movies that we had done. And there were certain movies, there was like 188 roles, seven women. You know, it's just, it's just for everybody, just the right movies, right television shows. Again, television, just because every week they need an entire new cast. There's much more opportunity for all you know, all ages, shapes, sizes, yeah. colors, everything, yeah. And that's the satisfying thing about 
doing television, I think, too, is that you have so many jobs to, that you can actually give people. Yeah. Now, the flip side of that is they never go home. <laughs> they are constantly working, and then there's no, you know, we sit in our movie theaters and go, oh, my God, look at my credit. It's so good. You know, everybody, that's such a good thing, right? And that, that episode goes off the air and no, right? It's like, okay, but they have another episode that they have to cast the very next week. There's no time for the, the patting themselves on the back. So I think the unsung heroes, really, are in the casting community are the week and week in and week out Day, um, casting director. Yeah, the episodic television casting directors, that is a grueling schedule. Yeah. Really grueling. But lots of opportunities for you guys. And they're amazing. I, I, I was on the CSA board, the Casting Society board, and I have dinner like every, once every two months with five casting directors that I was on the board with. And they're all television casting directors. And there's not a person in the world right. they don't know. It's amazing to hear them go. Despite good preparation, sometimes nerves do kick in and affect the audition. Do you factor that in? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. No, because if you're going to be nervous for me, you're going to be nervous in front of the camera and 75 other people. No, I don't. I mean, I don't. I factor that in as a negative. If anything, I'm like, no, you you need to work that out. You've got to get up there and figure that that out because I can't or use it and you know, use it in a way that it's part of the character. And I don't know, it's just you being nervous. That, I also think though that sometimes it, it, it helps also, the more you see people, the more, the, more, you know, the more times people come in, the more you know their habits and the more you know who they are. And there's some days where it's just not your day, it's not happening that day. <laughs> and when you can tell it's that, something, I'll just say to somebody, look, it's not your day, why don't you come back another day? I and mean, you can't do it too often, you'll be redoing it a million times, but we all have those you know, your car broke down, and, 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 and if you give the excuse, it probably won't happen. I won't do that, but if you can just tell that you've really put in your work and there's just a mental block happening, that happens. Yeah, you guys, you need to take kind of ownership of who you are as a person and as an actor, and what do you need to do to give yourself the best chance to succeed? How do you fight those nerves? How do you sit in that waiting room with lots of other actors? Do you need the earbuds in with the music? You know, are you a person who can go in and chat effortlessly and make all sorts of fabulous pithy comments and then jump into you know a really emotional scene or are you somebody who needs to say I need to act I need to do the scene first and if they have questions afterwards and then how do you finesse that but you need to know those things you need to know if you're someone who can give three really good auditions a day or if you're only a one a day person you know and you need to take ownership of that and figure out how that all works for you what is your biggest pet peeve for each of you in the audition room? Unpreparedness. Yeah. Yeah, I'm prepared and, and the excuses that we've, you know, the person who comes in and leads with all the excuses. Well, this should be interesting. What is the oddest thing you have ever seen as a casting director? What? <laughs> what is the oddest thing you've ever seen as a casting director? <laughs> I don't know if it's the oddest, but it's my favorite. Okay. Um, I was auditioning kids that hadn't really acted, that was like finding them on basketball or ball courts and stuff for Coach Carter. And this adorable kid was reading, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he went. And I like, looked at my sister, and I was like, I don't know what that was. Okay, well, we'll do it again. So we did it again, and he said his line, he said his line, and then went. And then continued saying his line, and I was like, fascinated. I couldn't figure out what he was doing. And I looked back at the material, and I had to go. When it says beat, it means take a pause. Oh, <laughs> sweet. That's cute. I'm not going after that. Did, did you cast that child? Did you get the part? You got, you got a call back. What do you think? <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> uh, bear with me because it takes a little bit of setup, but working on a show right now. It's a pilot. Producers like to meet actors and kind of, you know, get inspired to actually write characters for them. That's how they, that's sort of their process. So they met with um, a stand-up slash actor and um, chatted and he left. And the next day, one of my producers is driving his kids to school and all of a sudden gets pulled over by a police car. Um, so the cop comes over to him, kids in the back seat, totally freaked out, thinking that something horrible is about to happen. My producer's trying to calm the kid down. 
cop, the cop, it turns out, is said stand-up comic from the day before, who somehow found out where my producer lived, followed him, and because he had worked on a show, which shall remain nameless so that we don't figure this out, um, had access to a police car. Okay? Story gets better. So after he reveals himself and thinks, ooh, hey, aren't I really cool and you must love me and think I'm really creative and want to hire me now, another police car pulls up. This time a real one who somehow found out that this guy was impersonating a cop and he arrested him. Gets better. <laughs> Producer takes the kid to school, calms him down, is relaying this really wild, bizarre story gets a call from stand-up uh, stand fake police officers, agent saying, I need you to call the cops because you need to help get my client out of jail. Oh, wow. um, odd, bizarre, strange, really bad judgment. Now my producer being a good guy said, okay, you know, you're not a criminal, you're just an idiot. So he helped him <laughs> and got him out of jail and explained the story. <laughs> this is like I'm going to pass on that one. Okay, this question is for Randy, but I would like anybody to answer. Um, I can't find an agent. The ones that are good won't sign you without good credits. Do you have any tips or suggestions? I get asked that question every day so many times, and it's, I wish I did. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've referred actors to agents and they haven't even been interested, and then people went on to work. It's. It's a, it's a crapshoot, there's no other word for it. But I also feel like there are, people do work a lot without agents and there are some good managers out there. It is getting harder and harder. I, I wish I could. But this is what I don't understand. And it's more of a question actually back to everyone. It's like we get calls from managers and agents all the time that I have no idea who they are, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're doing television and when I'm doing, when I was looking for televisions for the for the under five lines, whatever, three, four, it does, I, I saw, I've seen so many names and so many Beverly mm -hmm. and Dean or whatever, mm -hmm. somebody else that I've never heard of out there. And I was like, so what I don't understand is why actors don't form a collective of their own agency that or their own that they that they submit and you and you work all together and you start um, you know now my co one. fellow colleagues would kill me I think because mm -hmm. there was a period I remember that certain casting directors was like if you weren't submitted by a certain agent or that and uh, but I think it was when we had to stack all the pictures up mm -hmm. and it wasn't just clicking mm -hmm. So now it's a lot of clicking. You know, you go down pages and you're taking looks and then you look at the resume. I mean, I'm always like looking and then I, then we're after that becomes it. But I don't understand why, if everybody is looking for an agent, um, it, why a, actors don't form their own agencies, actors for actors, and if you, you know, and I, I don't understand why you don't. AFA, That's I like it, actors for actors. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have two questions here about postcards. One is how often should an actor send them? And the other uh, is do postcards help us to jog your memory um, and help us in being called in for more auditions? Um, again, I think maybe for TV, there's, I think you, again, it's a timing thing. First of all, I would say, for the first part of the question, I would say don't send them unless there's something legitimate to say. So, hey, I'm going to be on something. Hey, I'm in this movie. Hey, I'm in this play. Come see me. Sure. Um, there's an actor who sends postcards every week. I don't know if you guys get them, but I do. Um, you know, I, it, it, it reeks of, um, well, I feel like I'm being stalked a little bit, but also, you know, um, it's, there's, there's no reason for it. It's a waste of their time and energy. Um, but in television, a postcard crossing my desk when I'm looking for these roles on, you know, 18 different shows that are all filming a new episode every week, it could very well get you an audition that could lead to a job. But I would say that, again, you have to use that discretion about how often you want to jog someone's memory or if you have something really legitimate to share with them in terms of watch me on this. Have any of you ever cast anybody, literally the postcard came across your desk at that just 
Well, I, br I brought people. Sure. No, I brought people in yeah. from looking at a postcard. Yeah. But I will tell you that maybe out of the twenty-five thousand postcards that I've got, there have been two people I've called in on on film because usually it's just bad timing. Mm -hmm. I, I think Randy said it really clearly. It was just really you. You have to hit it at that right moment. Um, and if you're not doing a weekly series, mm -hmm. then that timing, it's, it's just usually off by some degree. Yeah, um, more for TV. Yeah. yeah. There, I think it's hard to conceptualize how much is actually coming at us on a given day. Like, it's not rare to have 35 postcards a day. So it really only jogs your memory if you actually know the person. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise, other than that, it would just be the timing thing. Um, okay, here's back to unsolicited. Um, do you ever read unsolicited mail, example, reels by actors? And if yes, how can I send you my reel for your review? Again, it, I think for us, for, if it's something I'm working on or even someone else is working on, it depends if it comes through breakdowns or something and it's appropriate to that moment. Like, it's so hard to just keep up with the amount of stuff you have to watch and go through and do every day that only in a lull would you have time to watch reels for some th that are just random, that aren't specific for what you're going through. But I would make sure that your reel is really good and pictures are really good on breakdown. Yes. So because I'm constantly getting submissions in, you get your submissions in and there's one picture of the person and you're like, mm, I don't know. But if there's a reel, because now they have the little space that you can click and see the demo reel, th and if you don't have your demo reel up there, I'm like, what? They don't have a reel up there. Like, I don't care if it's like you doing your your at home video of a scene that you not with you know have it on you, not the other person. Um, you know, up there because then it gives me a better sense of the without just and have several pictures up there. But the reel is really important to get up there, and it's more important to have the reel up there than sending me the reel. I would think. Yeah. There's another question on here that I've actually have the several actor friends that have asked me about. Um, it says here, because of my accent, I'm typecast a lot. What's your view about actors with accents? Does well, I, we, because of the international now, I'm constantly seeing international actors, and some of them in certain countries, their accent is harder to just, you know, you, you, you can't, you have to be looking for them with an accent. But what I would say more important than worrying about your accent and, and kind of erasing it is I would say then you just have to really be articulate so that I, you may have an accent, but I understand everything you're saying. So that's where the biggest problem I have with anybody with an accent is I'm like, and listen, I have mush mouth and I can barely speak English, but it's like, you know, it's important for you as actors to be able to articulate with an accent or without an accent what you're saying. Out of curiosity, if somebody had, and this is just my question, if somebody had an accent and it wasn't the right accent for the role, but you really thought they were, like, they had the perfect look, they were very, very talented, do you spend the money getting them a coach? Do they get the job or do you move on to the next person? So it, would, it, would have to be, it would have to be a lead of a big movie and they would have to be pretty darn close accent-wise. You, you know, you can, most people can only take so much of a leap and then there's people that over years, I mean, I remember the first time Alex Skarsgård came to town and he was really good but his accent was really thick and every time he came back it was less and less until he could do, you know, until he was it, uh, not Band of Brothers, the other one, uh, the miniseries when he did A Perfect American. Um, you know, I think it, it does limit you sometimes, depending on depending upon what the film is or, or where it's, it takes place, and all of, all of those situations. It just the more you can do, the more it opens yourself up to other options. You know, you have, there's more roles available to you. Okay, this question is for all three of you. It's what upcoming projects are you looking forward to casting in 2013, and what do you expect to be the most challenging characters to cast of the ones you're working on? Um, well, right now I'm in the middle of casting um, Virgins of America for Paramount, so it's all teens. It's all like 18. To, so I have two um, two movies in a row that have young, very young people in them. And it will, for the adults in those movies, it will depend on where we shoot. Mm -hmm. And we have no idea right now where either the, we, we think maybe Puerto Rico is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, good. Do you have a casting director that you use there? Oh, okay. I've been looking. Okay, there we go. Right? See, and that's come, and location casting directors become very important in our lives. 
um, now. So that's why you need to stay in touch with those location casting directors. Um, so that's one, and then we're going to do um, Boy Scouts versus Zombies, um, which is another very young 15 year olds. But I probably will use 18 to play 15 because I want to use their hours and. You know, so if I can play an 18-year-old, it's 15, 16, then I can use a 21, 22-year-old to play the 18, 19, and it'll look right. They haven't announced all their movies yet, so I don't know what I'm allowed to say on that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Don't want to get anyone Oops. in trouble. <laughs> We've got two uh, international co-productions coming up. Um, one is a new a retelling of Dracula starring Jonathan Rhys Myers. Um, and we are going to be filming that in Europe and it's going to be all EU actors so anyone who has an EU passport so we're not going to be able to bring any American actors because we're not using we're not using SAG after we're using their it's the way we did tutors when I was back at Showtime it's frustrating I know um, but so for me the challenge is going to be you know getting to know the European marketplace for a lot of the smaller roles so I know a lot of the bigger actors but a lot of the smaller roles I don't know and we are also you may have seen this on deadline last week doing um, a pirate television show called Crossbones um, that uh, Neil Cross, who created Luther, the television show, is writing for us. And uh, that's the one we may film in Puerto Rico because they may have a pirate ship for us. So there you have it. Okay, um, how did you get into casting? Um, and I'd like to add why you chose this career. And um, what do you love most about your job? Um, I was um, a PA on a movie and it was my senior year in college and I was going to go to law school and I thought I was going to you know, fool around for the summer and do an internship and it was on Mississippi Burning and um, they, they put me finally in the accounting department for a week and they were like, oh, that's a disaster, so <laughs> go on set. And I was out there and if anybody had seen the movie, it's a period movie and it's a great movie, but there were these group of people over there and I turned to Alan Parker at one point and said, um, those people look too contemporary for the scene. And behind him, Gene Hackman was like, <laughs> and shows so be quiet, he's just going to kill you, right? And he looked at them and looked at me and he said, you know what, you have a good eye. Go over and meet with Sherry Rhodes. Wow. And Sherry Rhodes was the location casting director. Um, and as soon as that little, it was only like three or four weeks there, and then I went back to school and I knew that that's what I wanted to do was casting. So I went to New York. Like a lot of actors, you go to New York, and all of a sudden it's like there were no jobs there for me. So I came out here, and Sherry Rhodes was looking for an assistant because she was doing Rush um, for Lily Zanuck. And, you know, it was only supposed to be for three weeks, and I was her assistant, her associate, and then her partner. And then I got greedy and got a movie in New York and went out on my own. So that was my joy experience. Mine's such like a long roundabout story. I studied I, I studied acting growing up and I never liked to be watched, so I would never do the play. I would just like do all the classes and then stop. Um, and and I, um, I interned at a talent agency in New York when I was in college and I would go back and forth and ultimately when I graduated they were offering me assistant jobs and like I'm from New York and I couldn't afford to live in Manhattan and I didn't want to share an apartment with nine people in a studio. And so they set me up with a job in LA and the first desk to open up, I became an assistant on, and it was in the comedy department, and that was when they were doing all the, the deals with the comics for, for pilots. So I had to be at comedy clubs like five or six nights a week and, and submit like who I saw, and, and it sounds really fun, and then by you know, the eighth week you're going, that guy's not doing that joke, I really like that. You know what everybody's doing. So I didn't want to be an agent, I worked for management companies, I'd always been working a second job, um, and then I went to work for a production company and randomly PBS was gonna to try to do a sketch comedy show. Yeah. And I, um, they didn't hire a casting director so I started getting tapes on all the people I knew from the comedy circuit. So they let me cast the pilot but I didn't like get paid anything, extra or anything. And then when I had to go back to my regular job, I had an attitude problem and I got fired. And, um, <laughs> and, I, and I earned that. And, um, and the next day, uh, Jane Jenkins and Janet Hershenson were looking for a receptionist and I started working and I got the job and I started working for them and then worked for them and a bunch of other people and then um, started as Risa Raymond Garcia's associate on Twister. And same thing, Joseph was our associate and then partner and then Risa went to direct and went off my own. 
Um, I grew up as a, I grew up in musical theater basically, so I grew up dancing. I was a dancer who could carry a tune, sort of, um, and very quickly realized that um, maybe I didn't want a, a career as a performer badly enough to, to kind of live that life, and so switched to the other side of it. While I was briefly um, pursuing it, rather than doing some of the jobs that you would do, wait tables, bartend, whatever, I actually started teaching. And through that, I started choreographing and directing musicals, which is when I sort of got the bit by the casting bug because I kind of felt like the most exciting time to me was actually not opening night, but it was auditions. And when people came in and wondering who I was going to see and what they were going to do and who was going to surprise me, it's kind of how I got bit by it. I started temping at Viacom Productions in the 80s and um, ended up working there. They brought me on full time and ended up working there for almost 24 years. Uh, via Common Showtime, left there and started at Universal Television a year ago. So, what's the best part of being a casting? If you had to pick one thing for each of you, it's definitely the actors. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's really it's it's you even if you you don't get to cast them, there's like this unbelievable sense of pride when they do well, even if you had nothing to do with it. Like it's just you can't. It's it's a hard it's a hard thing to describe. You kind of start to feel like really attached to so many people and so proud as they move along. Yeah, we are yeah. rooting for each and every one of you. Um, is there anyone that you, any of you have given a break to that is maybe a big star now that you just, you believed in them before? Well, what I, I always know? say is that their grandmother gave them a break before we gave them a break. Their English teacher, their drama teacher, yeah. their agent, their manager. So to sit, we're, we're, we're part of their life, part of their wheel, part of their journey, um, but just one part. Yeah. You all are, you know, have a lot of people to thank for the journey that you go on and, and your path. Very well said. Yeah. Um, you already answered this question in part when you said that you do look, um, you know, on the web for new talent. But um, this question is, what databases besides IMDb do you use for finding talent? So in addition to IMDb and... Oh, wow. Breakdown, right? Yeah. Breakdown services, actors access. Google. I, I just, you know, if, if you're I, looking yeah. for something specific, yeah. you just start Googling. Get, getting on a pathway and seeing where you land. Okay. Uh, who makes the final casting decision? Is it the casting director, the director, or the producer? Or is it very per? In television, it's actually the president of the network if it's a series regular. Um, it, um, if it's a smaller part, it varies from network to network, and it also depends on how um, powerful your executive producer is. There, you know, in years gone by, people like Stephen Bochco, David Kelly, they didn't have to run a lot of their casting choices by networks and by studios. Um, everyone always runs their series regulars by them, but um, so it, it varies from situation to situation. Um, in television, the executive producer is more the king than the director, which I think it is in features, right? That's what the director The director's more yeah. king. Yeah. 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 But it depends. I mean, it's, it, it really is about where the, and it's, you know, it's, it's not power. It, it is power, right? I mean, it's, it's a, sometimes it's the director, sometimes it's a producer that brings in the project, and then sometimes it's, um, you know, our president and, um, and so, yeah, it varies. And then as you get further down, then it's, it's really about the, it's a lot of people coming together and agreeing that, um, you know, what's best. And sometimes it is, is the cliche, it's three people and, you know, everyone sort of likes two of them, but the third one is the, um, you know, is the one that gets it. Because that's, I want to It's never just one person. I don't think never it's one ever person, just one person. Yeah. Please describe your daily routines so that we can understand better what you do. <laughs> well, exactly sure yeah, let me, let me tell you my daily routine as an independent, and then I'll tell you my daily routine as an executive. My daily routine as an independent, I got up, I had coffee, I had a friend I played backgammon with, <laughs> always with coffee. So that was the first two hours of my independent life, and then I went into the office, and I worked pretty much from 11 to 6. And I would do my session in the afternoon, and 
you know, and I would go home by 6, 6.30. Um, and that was pretty much, if you, as an independent, if I didn't want to, you know, have a session on a Friday, I didn't have it, and, you know, you'd schedule your meetings around to accommodate that life. Now, on the flip side, what Beth says, there's no, there's no sure thing that you're going to have a job after you finish that job. So you finish that job and then you're like, well, am I, you know, if you're lucky, you have some uh, director that's like, oh, I'm going to have this come up or you do an independent, another movie, and you create that. So at the beginning of your career, it's, it's like the beginning of a career of an actor. You're sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring and you're trying to figure out how to make the money last through the month so that you do your next job. And I've never been good at that part. I sort of just put myself to bed and <laughs> hid until the phone rang. And I mean, there was one time that I actually went with my friends, dressed up, went to lunch, because, and basically told all my friends I was actually going to work, but I didn't, I went to the lunch with them, and then I came back home and got back into bed waiting for that next movie to come. So as my career, as you do movies, and they work, then all of a sudden you get a reputation and you get more jobs, so, um, you know, and then you, you know, then there's always, you know, you do a pilot a year, so there's, all of a sudden you feel like there's a little more consistency. My job now is, I started at 8.30 in the morning. I have a 9 o'clock meeting on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, an afternoon meeting on Monday and on Thursday afternoon. Um, and then there are the screenings and the dailies. So dailies are when, the, when they're shooting, they send all the dailies to the studio, and so all our movies we go in and we watch. So like you say, there's a script, there's a movie when you first read a script, and then there's the movie while you're casting the movie, and then there's a movie in the dailies that like, you're like watching dailies every day, these scenes, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's how they're gonna shoot, that's how that unfolds. So there's another movie there. And then, um, and then at night, we go to the screenings. So we, you know, all those recruitment that you hear about, um, come see the movie, and then you see sort of these people that are look stressed out of their minds, okay? <laughs> I'm part of that group, and I call that group sort of the wall, and right, and we're, I consider myself part of the wall, which means that I go to that movie, and I might have gone to that movie or screening three, four, five times, depending on how many um, screenings they have, and I am there only until my boss decides that he does not need me anymore, you know, there may be, but I'm there so that if there comes a question up against, um, casting or wardrobe or hair or anything that they feel like, well, we'll ask Joseph, then I'm there waiting to come in and go, you know, sometimes it's as simple as, now who's that actor that's in that scene, that small actor? And, you know, and I need to be there ready with the answer. And then they're very gracious about it. They're like, great, you know what, that was awesome, you guys go home, it's all good. And then they'll stay and they don't stop working. I don't, you know, my bosses just constantly work. So in that part of the job of you do have a third relationship. If you're in a relationship, what you have to realize at a studio is that now you have another relationship because it is like a marriage working for a corporation. It's, it's yours and then theirs and they come into your life. But in some ways, I, who knew that I, I could have just joined the Army? Because I love being, uh, knowing where I'm going to be and knowing that my schedule for the week is sort of already planned. And I love a meeting. Who knew? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. That's the difference. And I, I think there's no typical day. I mean, you know, you're putting out fires all day long. And like today, I try to get some test deals closed. I watch an enormous amount of auditions, I, you know, had one two-hour meeting, one one-hour meeting, uh, you know, I, I mean, I can't even remember what else I did today, it was a long day. But, and you but, read yeah. scripts too, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I you read scripts that are going and that are new drafts that are going and, new, and movies that may yeah. go. Yeah, I, I put, I, and like that was a thing that we got a couple before the weekend and I put them all off, of course, and read, like, you know, started at 10 o'clock last night and read at 3 before this morning is meeting at 9. Yeah, I mean, you know, the staff meetings take up a huge chunk of our week. 
you know, you, you've got casting meetings, you've got a development meeting, you have a business affairs meeting, you have a finance meeting, you may have a studio meeting, you may have a network meeting, you may have casting sessions. You, I mean, for me, every day is different, but it's a combination of those things. It's, it's triage. It's, there's a ton of fires, which is the biggest one or which is the most immediate one that you need to deal with right away. Um, and then it's looking forward too. You have the stuff that you're working on right now, and then there's the scripts that are in development, and they're like, well, you know, give us 10 great ideas for the star of that, and who can we attach to this one? And so, you know, you're dealing with what's happening right now and what may be happening three months from now, and, you know, it's juggling a lot of things. It's really exciting. It's great. It's a very high class problem to have if it sounds at all like we're complaining, which we're not. Um, but there's no formula to my day. How can actors get a general meeting with one of you? Uh, uh, it's funny, this comes up a lot and, and honestly as far as general meetings go, unless you've got an incredible piece of work coming out, I, I don't think it helps all that much. I tend to like everybody I meet and it's like there's a really nice person but it doesn't really give you a gauge. It, it helps more like if you're you know, if you've just played Jeffrey Dahmer in a movie and you're great at comedy, that would make sense to meet with you to see that, to see that you know, you're, you've got a lighter side. It, it, it really helps to have something to base it all on and then see where it expands from that. Otherwise, it's just like having a really great dinner party. You know, it's lovely and you meet nice people, but I don't think it necessarily really comes into play unless you've got something to back it up. Have any of you ever had a general with an actor and then maybe they weren't on your radar, but that sort of sparked something? in that meeting? Well, I think a general here, the difference is because it, how do you get an audition and how do you get a general? Because a general is just, uh, you come in and you're not performing at all and you're just saying hello. And that's where it becomes a very friendly thing. And I think it really is helpful for actors who have been established or that you're up for, I always tell, because we get calls from agents every day about, oh, will you do a general, will you do a general? And I always say, if that person is in a mix in one of our movies and I don't know him, then that would be a good time for me to do a general because then when I'm going back to my meetings and that guy is in the mix, I can talk well of him, right, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and so that can be a real useful um, tool for both of us, right, for the agent, for the actor, for me. But for, the, for just to, to make the agent feel good that the actor has come on and said hello to me, it really doesn't serve either one of us very much. It's like, hello, and then I'm like, okay, and now I need to find you a role that you can read so I can actually see where you are for me on the scheme of, what the, of, of your ability and where I can use you. And that usually comes from just auditioning. So, you know, so, that, so then I think the better question is, how do you get an audition with a, with a casting director? And part of it is about, that's why representation helps, and a representation and a, um, having a dialogue with the casting director that you trust. Like, I have agents out there that I don't trust because they constantly sell me things that don't deliver, and after a while, you're like, mm, I'm not sure if I believe that. Then on the flip side of that, there are actor agents out there that are constantly saying, no, you need to see this person. And every time I have, whether they were right or wrong for the role, I was like, yep, there's something there. Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, I'm gonna trust that a agent or that manager. And then about just actors, if you don't have that, you gotta have somebody that believes in you. And then if you don't have that person, then how do you do it? Then I think it's if you have a webisode or if you have a video, um, listen, a lot of casting directors are not hiding. I think there are a lot of casting directors that want a privacy thing. I can't promise you that you're gonna, I'm gonna watch your video, but my email is up on CSA. And so if you can, you know, you can go up there and, you know, during the holiday break, I may be sitting somewhere bored because of ADD and I need to have something to do constantly. I may go through and go, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I should bring that person in and make a note. So um, for me, I would say go to CSA and, and put up your best shot. And, you know, commercials, day players. I mean, people ask that question a lot, is a role too small? I remember when I was working for Jane and Janet that Steven Spielberg's office would call all the time and say, Steven was watching TV and he saw this soap commercial and there's this guy, and I can't tell you how many of those guys like ended up 
having good roles in projects, or even, you know, I'll, I'll watch TV. I, I mean, before she was on Community, I stalked a vet, Nicole Brown. I saw she was a day player in something. <laughs> and I was like, who is she? And she ended up getting a part in a movie, you know, a movie I did. I think people are always watching, so there's nothing too small, because it's just a matter of, oh, that, that's interesting, or, oh, God, I forgot about that person, or, mm -hmm. you know, especially now, I think there's a lot less work to be had, and it's not the good old days where, you know, not, it wasn't the good old days, actually, where people are like, oh, well, they, I, they only did one line. I don't really ever think of people as a one line actor, I mean, if they've got the skills to do more. What are your thoughts on improv during an audition? Mm -hmm. You have thoughts, okay. We'd love to hear them. Um, after doing a lot of television, I find that a lot of the television writers are quite offended if you change a single word or a pronoun. If you change it to the I, they stop listening to your audition and could care less if you are a good actor and a lot of people are just, you know, they changed my word and then that, that spirals into what are they going to be like on a set, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's certain casting directors and or projects where they'll tell you that it's okay to take that license, but I would say that it's, it's a, a I hate to say a bad decision, but it's a huge risk that normally has a negative result if you improv in an audition without being told that that's okay first. We've used improv a lot, I, I find, but often it's because there's not a solid scene that gives the characteristics of what the director wants to see, so you use it as a tool as well. Like there might be a scene and then an improv, or it might be a scene and then we'll break off into an improv, but it is usually something that we say up front. It's not, you know, just go off on the dialogue. But but some 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 writers do give you the freedom, and we do let that be known if that's the case. No, I mean I think it would work if you if you I oftentimes with with um, with actors that are doing improv, like you've taken the scene and basically you're improving on it, so you're adding on to it your own writing skills and creativity. Sometimes a little bit in a film audition because I think in television, which we've said before, the writer is king. So if the writer is king, you've got to play by his rules, right? Well, the director is usually the king in ours, so the writer is not in the room, so the director is not as, 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 as sensitive to it. But what I will also say is that if you go way off of your script, and that, then I'm like, oh my god, what is he doing? And I don't remember that. When do I come in with my line? Right. And I'm like, then, be, right? then I start fretting, so then it's not a good thing, right? So I think a little bit. But I wouldn't think you're so creative that you're going to be better than these high, highly, highly paid writers. So, you know, but I did hear a funny line the other day, and somebody had lived on it, like, oh my God, if that director was smart, he'd write that note down <laughs> and he'd add it into the script later. So, you know, a little bit be, but use it, you know, like cayenne pepper. Just a little goes a long way. There's an interesting thing about that, too, that I found in. Um, one film is in the stage directions. I was working on a, a film and the writer was the director and everybody was doing this one particular thing and the, the director said, why is everybody doing that? And I said, well, you have it written in the stage directions. And it never dawned on him that, for, for him, that was for the financiers and everybody else reading the script. He didn't, he didn't dawn on him the actors were taking it as, as the law. And I found over time, like, if, very, very often that is just to set the scene and set the mood and it really isn't exactly what they're expecting the actor to do. And if you feel trapped by that or it doesn't feel organic, I, I would say don't stand, don't stand by it. Don't feel the need to, to make that motion or, or, or do whatever that is because quite often it, it wasn't written for you even though I understand you're searching for, so, you've got so little information, you're searching for anything you can get, but it can, it can end up hurting you if you feel con confined by that. But you're talking about the stuff in between, in between the dialogue. Yeah, the oh, by the way, the I think the stuff in between the dialogue you should erase. That that shouldn't be, you should know the words. Yeah. But people usually hold like they think hold, that's yes. a law. Oh my god, I've like, got to cry here. Yeah. Right, no, take that away. Take the beat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. No, I think you should learn it without that. Do you think great actors can lift poor material? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I've done a lot of shitty movies <laughs> that my actors really lifted up, let me tell you. Yeah. I agree. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. How often do you see plays? And do you see more comedy, as, uh, Laugh Factory, Comedy Club, improv? 
I go through waves, like I'll see a bunch, and then I'll see a couple of bad things in a row and I need a break, and then I'll go see again. I think it also depends if you're auditioning a lot, you kind of can't, like your brain can only take so much information that, that you, you just can't. But then there's certain things like I just like, I cannot see Danny in the Deep Blue Sea or Italian wedding, rec <laughs> you know, rec American reconciliation anymore. Like I just can't mm -hmm. do it. Like, you know, cause that's, it's, so there's certain pieces that actors used to showcase themselves and it's not about the play, it's about them. And that just gets laborious, <laughs> but um. And I still try like to stay away from two people plays, you know? Yeah. So if you're gonna go to a play in LA, you know, then you, then for me, it looks, you know, I look at the venue because that will determine whether I'm more inclined to go. Mm -hmm. And then if it's not at certain venues, then I'm like, okay, if it's 10 actors in a piece, then I'm like, hmm, that may be interesting if I want to kill an evening and, you know, and I do like sometimes go, you know what, I, I go to the theater tonight if, mm -hmm. if there's so, so then it's about the postcard, it's about the timing of those 10 actors. But if it's, you know, on Melrose and it's two people, I'm like, hmm, probably not. I'm not gonna probably go, unless it got amazing, amazing reviews and somebody, and I was going with somebody, um, but I'm more inclined to go with something if it's just random with, you know, a bunch of actors in it so that I feel like I get the most use of my time. Um, but we go, but the truth is it's like I just came from New York and for four days and I saw seven plays, um, you know, so in certain things and I, you know, I, 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 like, I like a good play. Um, Randy, I believe you already said that you did study acting. Mm -hmm. Not that you wanted to be an actress, but you were studying acting. Um, so for Joseph and Beth, and if you want to add anything as well, um, did you study any acting methods to give yourself a vocabulary when working with actors? Yeah, when I went to New York, I went to the Neighborhood Playhouse, and um, and then with Greg Zittle, and, um, and for me, it was kind of like therapy. I was like, this is fantastic. You're like, but I don't want to do it. But um, it's, yeah, I mean, listen, I can't do it. You, I, my hat's off every time an actor comes in and uh, when I believe something has happened, I hope that the little training that I have had hopes that I can at least deliver the lines a little bit better than just looking at the page to give you a little bit something to work off of. So, you know, that's hopefully what it did for me. Do you think that you do you think that you would have been as interested in being a casting director had you not taken those acting classes that you took? Question. Um, probably because I just like watching people. You know, I'm just. It's like the bet. You know, I love to watch people to get paid for it. How fantastic is that? You know, you can't, you can't ask for better than that. Yeah. All my training was prior to becoming a casting director. So I mean, I really. The majority of my training was in dance and musical theater. Um, I wouldn't say that I studied any one specific technique. Um, but I do think it gave me, and the few auditions that I didn't talk myself out of, uh, <laughs> which was a big sign to me that I wasn't meant to, to be in front of the camera. Um, you know, I, I do think it gave me a better understanding of, of what you guys go through, you know, and, and what the process is from your point of view. And I think that it gives me empathy as opposed, you know, to, to really understanding the process. Um, and I also think all my performance background, just like Joseph said, you know, gave me, hopefully it's, I give you a little something to work off of without not, without, uh, you know, ruining your audition. Um, Okay, as a casting director, do any of you ever get starstruck? I met you the Muppet person that really did it for me. I have to say, like, I'm, I never get starstruck, but the Muppets almost made me cry. <laughs> sure, it's like, you know, it's like anyone else, but it, it's, um, but we also have a job to do. So there's a little bit of like, oh my God, I love that actor so much. And then, you know, you still have to, it's, find the phone number that works for the piece. So, you, you know, that might not be the right number, but yeah, I mean, and by the way, it's not just super famous, like, you know, the Geraldine Pages of the world when I was super young and ran into it at a bank and I was like, oh my God, it's Geraldine Page. Um, but it's, it's an actor, character actor that, you know, that I know I've seen a hundred times and you're like, oh my God. 
God, you know, Richard Schiff, you're so good. You know, that, so I think that's the joy of it, that you're like, oh, and then when you see somebody do a great job, or, you know, even in a small, you're like, oh, you're so good. That part of it is so joyful for us. It's like. Yeah, I would hate to ever lose that, actually. I mean, I think if I, if I ever lose that joy, starstruck, excitement, then maybe it's time for me to, you know, think of hanging it up. Um, you know, I love the fact that I get excited, whether it's a big star or, as Joseph said, just a great actor, that I'm excited to be in a room with them. How many auditions can you have in a day before you just, you can't, you need to, like, turn it off? Because I assume after 20 or so, Well, sometimes 50. you can't turn it off because sometimes you don't have time. I mean, listen, yeah. in television, it's like you, you just have to stay in there with it. So you're a marathon runner, too. It's like because sometimes that role has to be cast and your name's on there and it's, you've got to find that right person. Um, so it, you just kind of, you know, like everyone, it's, it's not any different. You just lift yourself up and you go, okay, I'll rest when it's over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the, the thing about casting, the really tiring part, is also just everyone's coming in so nervous and a good portion of your job is to make them feel comfortable and put it at ease and make everything as relaxed and, and do all those things which just to not absorb all the nervous energy, just to placate that is exhausting. You know, because you really just want everybody to, to feel their best and leave with dignity and all of those things, but, but some sometimes it just takes a lot of effort to get somebody's energy to focus. Besides having the right look and giving a good audition, what else do you look for in a person? It goes back to the dating reference. Like it's never, it's never just one thing. There's just uh, some people you just can't take your eyes off of them and maybe it's just for that specific thing. There's just, it's, it, and sometimes it can be things, I mean it's cr stupid things like sometimes if somebody's absolutely insane, but, 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 but in a, not in, in a controllable way, they can just sit in a chair and it's so much more fascinating because their brain is God knows where, you know? Or, or I think an interesting thing, we were doing a movie called In the Valley of Ella and almost everybody in the cast was actually a, a, a vet, you know? And we'd have real actors and then people that had served in the war sitting there and without knowing any of them you could immediately pick out who the who the vets were because they just had this kind of heavy weight on them and sometimes it's you know and that's really exciting for that circumstance would be really sad you know it's really sad for life but it, it changes constantly and sometimes it's just exactly how you vision that role to be or sometimes it's not how you vision that role to be and somebody brings it to life in a way that you never saw it happening or make you understand a line that you never understood before and all of that is what makes you spark up. It's interesting because everybody tells you know actors that they have to study, they have to take classes, but there's a recent movie out, Beasts of the Southern Wild, mm -hmm. for instance, where you know the lead, I cannot think of his name, but he, he's a baker yeah. in New Orleans and the little girl had never acted. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be like there's more roles right now for people that aren't even professional actors and they're getting major parts in movies. I, th I think that has to be so much, that has so much to do with the director as well. It has to be people having, willing to go there. You know, there is an innate skill, but it's also, it takes a really special person to nurture that. And there's a lot of directors that come just from the world of shooting and they're fantastic visually and they don't know how to give a direction to an actor or they'll give something you're thinking like, that's not a playable note. And then there's people that really love actors and know how to speak and know how to get those performances. And I find, I've worked with people that are really, really good at that, like, like Gavin being the perfect example. I mean, we've just always had the real element, like a real hockey player is a miracle, a real, some mixed martial arts people in Moorier, you know, that's mm -hmm. sort of the way he worked. But then there's other people who wish they can do that. And then when you bring them the real thing, they're like, they can't act. And it's like, you have to know how to finesse and speak and work and dig. And, and it's, it's, it's a really, really tough process that the directors don't get enough credit for. And the actors, I mean, the actors, it's, a lot of it is them as well too, but it, it, it's, it's a pretty rare find. What do you think is the best training? Because there are so many acting classes. I mean, there's just, I, I wouldn't even know as an actor if I was out here where to look first. Uh, but I don't think there's one road. And so, but I would, the only thing I would say is that if you're on a road and you're studying and that person makes you feel bad about yourself and every day you go to that class and you have a pit in your stomach, not in an exciting way, 
but in a why am I not good enough way, then you need to get out of that. Right. Like that, it's, you know, there is not one more, there's more ways of going through this life, and that is not the way to go through. Yeah. So, you know, I always said, because this reality casting has come up now, and it's more, you know, and I have had directors that, um, uh, you know, the one thing I've always asked my director, I said, listen, I said, I understand that you want homeless people to play the homeless people, but if I can bring in an actor and you can't figure out if they're homeless or not, then you need to figure, then you need to, then you need to hire the actor. Um, because, <laughs> right? So... I'm always like trying to, I, you know, admit, and maybe I'm sensitive about that, but I always feel like I can find that in an actor, the person that is real. And, you know, there's in children, and this is obviously the little girl is fantastic, but, you know, and they looked at like two, 200,000 or 2,000 kids. I can't remember the number, and, and she's fantastic, but um, that's youth, and that's a, a specific, but we're talking about journeymen. We're talking about actors that come in every single day and give lines meaning and lift a truth and bring a truth to a screen to a scene and do that consistently. And I don't think the man on the street can do that. And I don't think actors can do it without really passion and talent and, and, and a desire that every day you wake up and you're like, I want to be good at my craft. How, what is your best, um, if each of you could give just three bits of the best advice that you can give to somebody who is just starting out. They haven't booked anything yet. They're brand new. I would say graciously aggressive. I'd say keep a positive spirit and train. You know, educate yourself. It's not just training in a thing, but it's like you need to be aware of life, of watch bakers, watch different people. You need to be a really good people watcher. Um, you know, that's part of your training is to, to be able to watch and shift subtly yourself and, and move things. Um, so, you know, but be passionate and stay positive. Uh, one, one, number, one of them is a two-parter. I think it just also goes back to the training. I, I think one of my advice would be continue to train and also switch up who you train with. It's very easy to, to all of a sudden be the best student in the class you're in, but I think you don't, everybody has something different to teach you and you might have different ways to approach a role. You might have different directors that speak in a certain way and you wanna be able to adapt to that, that kind of voice. Um, the second I would say is have a life outside of acting. It's, it's a, it's, it never gets easier, like no matter how successful you are, it's, it's just hard and if you just focus on what auditions you have or what auditions you don't have or something, it's going to take away from you as a person and it's going to make just take away from your performance too. I mean, you know, you can, you can smell bitter or desperate a mile away and that's never good for anybody. And the third would be, yeah, it sounds cliche, but I think, think of every audition as just a chance to act instead of thinking with the final outcome of a job, it'll take the pressure off of you and actually let you like, that might be that that is your time to play that character that you research and enjoy it um, kind of piggybacking on what Randy just said I think balance is really important in your life um, and when I go and teach classes the first thing I do with a new class is everyone has to go around and introduce themselves to me by telling me three things about themselves that have absolutely nothing to do with being a performer nothing. You'd be amazed at how hard it is for certain people to do it. Um, it's really, it's kind of a fun exercise. It ha I had it happen to me in a class and then I just kind of stole it. Um, but it points out that balance and diversity and having a life out, you know, other than just acting. And that's not to say that you shouldn't give 150% to everything you do in your acting life. But if you have things outside of, outside of the acting, um, it's going to inform your, your choices and your roles. It's going to make you a happier and healthier human being, which is going to make you a better actor. And I just, it's so important. Um, I also think that it's important that you never let anyone tell you that what you, the choice that you made was wrong. I, 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 I hear that so often, you know, they made the wrong choice in their audition. I don't think there's, I don't think there's a wrong. And, I, and if you're studying with someone who says that to you, Again, I think you should find somebody else to study with, but there may be a choice that ends up being more appropriate given a, a director or a writer's vision. 
but there's never a wrong. And, you know, so that, that speaks to being positive. You guys, if, if this is what you love more than anything else, you owe it to yourselves to, to never give up on it and to give, you know, to give yourself every opportunity to succeed. And everyone's going to be on a different path, so I can't tell you what, you know, what, what that is. But um, stay positive and constantly keep doing things. Keep acting, keep finding new ways to study, keep doing new things. Remember, there's a whole world out there. One of the things that I think is a problem for Los Angeles is that our town is really centered around the entertainment industry. And I think sometimes we lose, we get sucked into that vortex and we lose sight of the rest of the world out there. Places like New York, the entertainment industry is a part of their city, but people still talk about what's in the news and what's going on in the world. And I think all those things are really important to you as humans and as actors. Do you advise um, actors to go to casting workshops? I have Do to say, really I've hired people out of them in the past. Um, it's such an individual choice. Um, and, you know, for some people I can understand you would feel why should I pay to audition. For other people they may see it as a chance to meet a casting director um, that they might not otherwise get to meet. I have truly in my past hired maybe a dozen people out of workshops. Again, it may be a needle in a haystack. If you're going to do it, you got to do your homework. You got to say. It might be better to do it for the agents, so right? Don't you think it might be a better use to do the agent workshop, agent and manager? Or you may learn something from a. Yeah, either way. Yeah. E you know, either way. I mean, if you're going to go do a casting director workshop, make sure it's somebody who's working on a show that you think you're right for. In other words, if they're casting all Disney shows with kids, um, a lot of people in this room, myself included, probably shouldn't take that casting director's workshop yeah. because they're not going to have opportunities for you. So it goes back to doing your homework and doing your research. And it's, you know, I, I'm of mixed feelings about that, but I have to say that like, my assistant associate have done them and we had a rule that they were allowed to do them as long as they brought back the photos of anybody they thought were good. Mm -hmm. And whenever we were looking for smaller roles and things, we, that's the, that's, we went through that file first before going to break down because it was like a pre-read. We already knew that they had a shot at getting the job because they were already good. But there's also, there's a SAG, there's a company at SAG or it's a CSA that will tell you the ones that are licensed appropriately. Right. And I have to say the ones where you tend to audition to get in were the ones that were always the best. Like there's a lot of kind of shammy ones out there and then there's some ones where, you know, you go into that room and half those people you see on TV all the time. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bummer, but I feel like it's gotten a lot of people work. It's so funny, I because uh, I've always been very against people paying to see me in LA. But I always thought that if somebody wanted to fly me to Washington, D.C., I would gladly do a workshop there um, and because I felt like I had a lot to give. Um, and in my many years of doing it, um, I always felt like at the end of it, I don't know why, because I feel like a little bit, um, and it's why I try to do these. I try to do a SAG workshop. I try to do um, an actor's network. I do a couple of these things that are all free every year in LA. And, that, and so I feel like that that's my way of giving to the actors of LA. But I also felt like over the years, I probably missed people that I didn't have representation and could have gotten roles in my movies if I had been willing to do that. But then, you know, it's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm very torn about it because I also don't feel like, you know, it's like it's enough that you train and you pay your teachers and to pay me, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a very, um, you know, I think there are two sides to it. So I don't think it's a black and white area. I think there's gray and everybody has to. You, and that's the thing, we all have choices. So I chose not to, to teach in L.A. Um, and maybe that was a mistake for me in time. Um, and then maybe you t taking the class was a mistake, you know. So everybody has to decide from their own what is right for the, what you can afford, what you want to do, who you want to see, um, you know. But I definitely feel like there are feelings on both sides of it. And if you are going to do them, I don't know if a lot of you know this, especially when it comes to television. Like I, I know my friend Michael Testa used to cast Cold Case, and at a, you know they had to match an older one to a younger one. And I think there was a two or three years they they're not allowed to cast anybody that they cast two or three years before, and because they were constantly matching. Like Michael had been, I mean, there was not an actor in town he didn't know, and he was going to them because he desperately needed to expand 
to expand his vision. So if you're doing that, like look at shows that have been on the air a while and, and, and try to find out what the policy is of how long they can go between casting things. Law like and order, exactly. Whole order was yeah, on, yeah, another one. Yeah. And making sure it's, an, and by the way, I think an associate yeah. is great because associates, sometimes my associates run my office. They're by half my brain as I keep everything moving. So they're constantly reminding me. I wouldn't do it with an assistant because assistants move around and I, I, I wouldn't do it with an assistant if an associate and assistant together would, but I wouldn't do it just with an assistant because I don't think that they have the experience or the credentials or that yet to, that you should be paying for. That's what I'm like I have to say, in the case of my, my assistant's been my assistant for six years and she just wasn't an associate because there wasn't like, you know, See, there wasn't room. There you so go. Like, it's, she's basically an associate just to know the credit. Right, there you go, yeah. right? See? Yeah. Oh. We, we've talked about chemistry of several times tonight and, um, I thought it was very interesting, Beth, that you said that a lot of the shows that you were working on, you hired people for the cast, and then you there were dailies, and you were watching them, and it wasn't working, and they were fired. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, when there's chemistry in the room, in the audition, why does that sometimes not translate in the actual final project? It's a really good question. Um, I, there's so many things, as we've been talking about, that change from what you originally read on the script to what you see in an audition, to dailies, to an edited piece. Um, I, I think in one case we heard, and I think this really factored into it, that the night they shot a particular love scene, um, the leading lady's fiance decided to come to set. And I think that really changed things. And had I known about it, I would have perhaps said to the producers, you need to stop this, because that scene was ice cold, there was no chemistry there. And now I understand why. And again, neither actor is at fault, <laughs> you know, that just that, that spark that everyone hopes for that can be magic wasn't there. But it can be something as simple as that. Um, it can be that in one case we actually couldn't do a chemistry read because our leading man was on Broadway in a play and he was gonna come back and start shooting the pilot. So we just had to take a leap of faith with an actress that we thought would be great. They didn't have any chemistry, you know? Again, both good actors, I would hire them both again. One of them had to go. Does that also happen in film? And what do you do when that happens? I think it's more, it's definitely in television because you're in your home every week, right? So there's a difference. I think you can, you can shoot in a film a couple of scenes and you're not going back every week to that scene and redoing it a different version of that. So I think we have a little bit, I mean, but when chemistry happens, it's, listen, that, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith happened. Yeah. So I wasn't there's gonna bring a moment, it up. you know, <laughs> you're like, you're, you know, you yeah. can't miss that. Yeah, so. we try, in film very often they'll do some kind of a screen test with, with Louise to see if there's chemistry, but again, you know, sometimes there isn't the day and then there's not on set. You just hope to see kind of something or see how they look together or... It's funny, I don't really think about too much about that part of my job isn't, I'm not watching too closely for chemistry. Because I'm not, it's rare that I'm bringing those two actors together, and it would have to be a very, spe it would have to be love interest and yeah, that, that, yeah. That's, that's but so yeah. many of our, but it's a, that's such a small part of our, at least what we're looking for in, in the casting of a whole movie, right? It's like, it's, a, it's an important part, but I'm. Yeah, but for us, if we're going to be living with them, hopefully for yeah. five or six years in a series, and you want to see, you know, the build to something like we did with Moonlighting, or will they, won't they, and, and so it's week in and week out, and it's just DOA on arrival, you have to make a change. Is Castle yours? Yeah. Oh, because they have good chemistry. They have such great chemistry. <laughs> oh, chemistry. That's Donna, right? Donna Rosenstein did that? Oh, is it? I don't know. It's good, so. though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At least she doesn't have but, you know, for, for Beth, like 30 Rock, mm -hmm. The Office, these shows that you've done, I mean, the, the entire cast has a chemistry. It's not even just a romantic chemistry. It's just between this, this energy between people. Yeah, you know, um, I don't get credit for either of those because those, those fabulous shows happened before I got to Universal Television. Um, but they're amazing. And, you know, you got to give Tina Fey and, and uh, who created that and Greg Daniels who created The Office. You know, they had a vision and a really specific style, I think, especially in The Office of what they were going for. And Allison Jones cast The Office. She's amazing. Um, 30 Rock is Jen McNamara, right? Yeah. 
also really, really great. And, you know, again, we were talking about relationships that you have with directors, producers, writers over the years where you really develop a shorthand between the casting director and you know, especially with comedy, I think every writer has a very different tone in comedy. So just because you can do Woody Allen doesn't mean that you can do The Office, you know? Um, so it's knowing those things and finding those nuances. And You worked on the pilot for Homeland, though, correct? Yes, I did before I left, okay. yeah. That is a brilliantly cast show. Thank there you. is Thank amazing you. chemistry on Thank that you. show. Thank you. And there are times that I've seen things that nobody else could do the role. Nobody else can be Dexter besides Michael C. Hall. I mean, there's just, you can't. Very proud of that one, too, yeah. There, um, there are certain roles that nobody else can do. Yeah, I mean, I it, Michael walks such a fine line, um, for those of you who watch that show. I mean, you may disagree with me, but he created a serial killer that you can root for if you really think about it. <laughs> I mean, that's you're hard, crazy to think about, right? right? But you start thinking about it, and you're like, wow. I mean, that's really a balancing act, you know? And I think that Claire and Damien and Mandy and that whole cast, although we did replace one person between pilot and series, Marina Baccarin was not the original person cast as his wife, as Damien Lewis's wife. Really? Mm-hmm. We made a mistake there. So in the audition, there was a chemistry, then you saw it on film, and that chemistry... There were no chemistry reads on that one because um, Claire was a straight offer, Damien was in London, and he was a straight offer. We auditioned people to play his wife and cast somebody just, you know, based on an audition, um, and we made the wrong choice. And I think, you know, they fixed that afterwards, and um, Marina wasn't available when we first started casting the pilot, but she was available when we went to series, and I think... Um, they made a, you know, made a great decision there. Um, how do you break down the material before an actor comes in to audition for you to get the sides together for the audition? I have a different process. I usually try to figure out what emotions, like what, what are the things we're trying to find out most in the, in the character and then, then pull the scenes that relate to that. Usually kind of polar opposites if, there, if there's a big arc. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, back to the workshops, the SAG Foundation does have free casting director workshops and you can go to the website at www.sagfoundation.org and check out the, uh, the program to answer yeah. for, for the year. Hey, hey. Um, Where they get to come in and actually work, yeah. do scenes? Oh, yeah. cool. I did not know that. So we've talked about a couple of your projects. Can, can Joseph and Randy, can you tell me maybe one or two roles that you think you've cast that nobody else could have done that particular role? Mm. I don't know that that's ever the case. There's always, you know, there's always somebody that would have done that role in a different way. I think there's certain things that just organically, like I read the script to Warrior and this was before Bronson had come out and I just, I turned to Gavin and I went, it's gonna be Tom Hardy and Joel Edgerton. And he didn't, know, he, he didn't know either one of them. And he said, why? And I said, it, it just is. I just know it is. And we saw all of these people and went through all of this stuff. And that's where it ultimately ended up landing. I think just sometimes you just have it. You feel it. Have any of you ever disagreed with a director and just felt so strongly there was someone that you just, this is the person, and the director didn't see it, and yeah. you ended up maybe getting your way? Or not getting your way. Or not getting your way. Not not getting getting your way. Yeah. yeah, we cry. Yeah. We, we, we you get cry hurt. too? Yeah. yeah, like we're, we're upset when somebody, and you're like, you're like, they could have had, that's what I always say, they could have had. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you kind of make peace with it because it is a process and there's other people involved. Mm -hmm. And that end, but then, you know, just when you could have had, then sometimes, you know, we are hired because we hopefully have a gift. And I, I don't know how that gift came, but it, you know, I do feel like there's, when, when this is clear, that third eye is clear, there's something that I know when you're sitting in a room and an actor comes in and you're like, that's it, that's it. I know, I got that one. And I can worry about other roles now because that one is it. Um, and I don't know what that is. I don't know if, you know, that's the gods. I don't know, you know, that's all the things, that's all the things that you've been doing up to that moment, it's all the things I've been doing up to that moment for that to be clear and, um, but when it works, it's great when, on both sides. When it works, it works. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, we're wrapping up, but maybe you guys could each give just one smidgen of advice yeah. to the actor out there who's just a little frustrated, they're, they're going on auditions or they're not getting auditions. 
They're not getting parts. Just a little frustrated right now. I think the the most interesting thing I've seen and. Like, I've been devastated that people haven't gotten jobs, and, and actors have been devastated they haven't gotten those jobs. And then it, it's turned around, and either that movie bombed, you know, that role wasn't theirs. Their, if, if they had gotten that role, they wouldn't be available for the thing that broke their career. I, I, it's, I just think you really have no idea what, there's a whole, like I said before, there's a whole world going on that you have no idea that's happening, and that can change your life at any given second, and you didn't even know that was a possibility. And it, the right role comes. I mean, I've seen it a lot. You know, I've just seen the people like on the brink of giving up and, and then that role happens or that thing that, or they've been working forever and can't take that next step and then that one thing changes the course of the rest of their career. And I think you need to be doing something for yourself. It's like you can't be waiting for the, you know, it's, there's very few stars in the world. So it's like if everybody could become a star, that'd be great, right? But I think that everyone that wants to perform, there's a, there's a venue out there for you. And you know what, if you're, you're doing your piece in front of six people, if you're doing it in front of two people, you're doing it. And that's the key. It's like, then you need to, I think you need to find somewhere to win every day. It's like, and it doesn't necessarily have to be with your acting, but if you can walk away every day and go, I want to do, I feel good about myself. I'm doing something for somebody else. I feel good about that. And that I think that's really important of keeping the long journey going. I think what they said was great. I agree. <laughs> Thank you so much.